This morning's reading comes from Mark chapter 14. So I'll fumble through it here. Uh, verses 32 through 42. Listen now for the word of God. They went to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to distress and ag- to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I'm deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he, again, he went away and prayed and sang the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Here is the reading. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray for hearts and minds to be open to your spirit. We pray that you would be near to us now as we meditate upon your word. And I pray for your will and words to come through, not mine. Amen. Throughout this Lenten season, we've been journeying with Jesus in his last week. Today we focus on Thursday, and a lot happens. The 14th chapter of Mark is full of big, sweeping moments that lead us up to the text we have for today. Jesus in Gethsemane, and the big moments that come after the garden. Jesus in Gethsemane is a pivotal moment in the timeline for his last week. If you read through Mark 14, the first two sections are a build-up to that big Thursday night when everything turns over. Mark 14 begins with a few verses that talk about a plot being formed to kill Jesus. It's a brief foreshadowing of the betrayal Judas will ultimately do that will come in just a few verses' time. And then we get this really beautiful story, one of my personal favorites, of the anointing of Jesus at Bethany. A woman, an unnamed woman in Scripture, comes with this very expensive jar of oil and anoints Jesus only to be scolded by the disciples. But Jesus jumps in and defends her, saying, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. The story is poignant because it highlights that the disciples still don't quite get it. They don't seem to quite understand what's going to happen. And yet this unnamed woman understands and knows Jesus is going to die. So she offers the best gift she has and anoints him with oil in preparation for his death to honor him. And then that plot to kill Jesus that we encountered in those first few verses is full, is fulfilled in the next chunk of text with Judas agreeing that he's going to betray Jesus. And then finally we arrive at that fateful Thursday night, and the text tells us that it's on the first day of unleavened bread, so it's Passover. And Jesus, the planner, and the one who's also going to fulfill this plan, is revealed to us again. He assures the disciples he has a place for them to eat the meal together, and how to go and get that place. 
And then Jesus, in his grace and love, prepares them for what's going to come. One of them is going to betray him. They are all going to desert him. And one of them, Peter, will deny him not once and not twice, but three times. Jesus has done all he can to prepare the disciples for what's to come. And then we get to our text for the day. Jesus praying in Gethsemane. Here we experience Jesus in his full humanity. He is grieving, becoming very distressed and agitated, and desiring one thing, his closest friends and followers to stay awake with him and becoming perhaps frustrated or maybe more saddened when they can't, won't, and ultimately don't stay awake. But the thing that's so utterly human about Jesus in the garden and is the prayer he prays, one that seems, well, needless to say, incredibly human. The text tells us he becomes deeply grieved, even to death. And then he goes and throws himself on the ground. Let's take a moment to let that image settle in our mind. The seemingly always calm, cool, and collected Jesus is so distraught that he throws himself on the ground. And then he prays, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Jesus in his full humanity cries out and prays boldly for something else, another possibility. And the text doesn't give us a response to that prayer, but rather, it seems, reveals the loneliness Jesus felt in this moment. He leaves his prayer spot to go and maybe find some comfort in his disciples, his friends that are hopefully staying awake and keeping him in their thoughts as he wrestles with this cup, only to find them asleep. And it happens not once and not twice, but three times. Jesus spent the night wrestling with God alone, and he prayed and he grieved. And by the third time, he finds those disciples and his friends asleep He's resigned himself to what's going to happen and what has to happen. Just as Reverend Darwin pointed out a few weeks ago, as Jesus wept over Jerusalem, and afterwards he wiped those tears from his eyes, and he moved forward doing what he needed to do in order to fulfill the plan. In a similar way, Jesus does it again. The third time he stumbles upon those sleeping disciples, he simply says, enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. He has wiped those tears from his eyes again and has prepared himself to face what's next. Gethsemane is the pivotal moment, that turning point in this story and in this week. As I grappled with this text, I had to ask myself, what is the gospel in this? What is the good news? Because it's heavy and sad, this text is. And maybe we're jumping a little too quickly to Easter here but I can't help but see the utter grace and love in Jesus' struggle and the ultimate resignation to drink from the cup. Jesus prays a prayer I know I've prayed before. I wonder if you have to. Afterwards, he wipes his tears and accepts what must happen next. His betrayal, his 
arrest, the trial, denial of friends, and his death. And he did it for us and for them and for this broken world. And as our text from last week reads, for God so loved the world that God gave God's only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. In the garden, we encountered the grief of God, and yet it's so wrapped in grace and love that I can't help but wonder if it's an invitation to allow God into our grief and messiness, trusting that we'll be met with God's grace and love, even when we can't stay awake. Amen.